بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome everyone to inshallah ta'ala our final session together uh, in our study of Surah Yasin, the heart of the Holy Quran. And we're going to inshallah jump right in because we really do have a fair bit of ground to cover today. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allahumma alimna ma yinfa'una wa anfa'na bima tu'allimuna wa zidna min fadlika ilman wa ta'animan innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir. ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Our journey through this uh, beautiful surah is drawing to its close today in our final section which has been simply titled conclusion. And it's not simply called conclusion because we are concluding today but because in many ways these verses are concluding. And what I mean by that is the general pattern to be observed in Quranic surahs, although you don't have sections called introduction, main argument, and so on, is that surahs start with an introduction and they set the scene. And then the surahs take you on this journey, a journey through argumentation, images, stories, a whole host of um, messages, you know, tugging at your mind, your soul, your heart, your conscience, in a way that a journey that we've been on ourselves. And then the surah brings that thread back to its conclusion. And the conclusion will typically mirror the introduction. And so our introduction was about the message and the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallama, and the conclusion is going to bring it back. And as it brings it back, what we're going to be seeing today is almost a perfect mirroring of the opening section. And so just to remind ourselves of the opening section that we started with, because we'll be mirroring it in a number of ways. Here is uh, the translation. Key in that was this central statement. You really are one of the messengers. And this wise Quran is the proof of that. The opening section, this slide you have on, on front of you, there's no um, arguments as such in it. It's basically statements of fact. There's implied arguments, i.e. the wise Quran is the proof that, but there's no explicit arguments, if you like. It's statements of absolute fact. You really are one of the messengers. And your purpose was to warn. And then you have recipients. And the recipients are of two types, group one and group two. Group one are a people that a word has become real against them. And they have this very peculiar internal state presented in this set of images. You know, they have collars on their necks, they're looking up, they have walls in front and behind. They cannot walk on a path. So the imagery of a path was being um, summoned in, in the background of that. And there's another group of people who have particular active traits. They follow the remembrance. Uh, and these are the ones who have a real warning. And so uh, that's how the surah started, statement of extreme fact, you really are a messenger. And this book is, is the proof of all of that. People are of two types and the word is true against some and the real benefit is of the other group. And then a final statement of the reality of resurrection. We really, we, we, the word we came three times in that verse. Verily, we, we, we bring 
the dead back to life. And we've inscribed everything. And what we're going to be seeing today is the perfect mirroring of this introduction. But the mirroring will itself contain a summary of the key arguments as well. A new presentation of the key arguments to really hit the conclusion home as the surah concludes. This is where we left off last time, just to recap, because we, had a, we came to a sudden conclusion last time. Last time we were speaking about the rising and the, the, the scene of the rising was uh, brought about by this sarcastic question. When is this day, if you're really speaking the truth? And suddenly they were told the day, the day, this day, this day, this day. And the promise was mapped out in front of them. The, the ending of the created order and then the rising for the judgment. And then these two groups we saw in the introduction being taken to the final outcomes. And all of this was a response to these people. So they were being spoken to, oh, sons of Adam, didn't we tell you this? Why did you do that? This is the hell that, that you were promised. And so the, the close of that exchange with them was this verse over here. In this verse, they were not spoken to anymore. The, the, the address turns away from them. They become third person after they were second person, which is to belittle them, but also it suits the images, the imagery of their mouths have a covering over them. So it suits the image that now their mouths have been covered, that there's no benefit in speaking to them anymore. The conversation of dialogue has come to a close through this image. Their state is being described. And so the Quran has this beautiful way of moving between second person and third person. And in this case, it signals the scene that the mouths are shut now. The dialogue is over. It's finished. Judgment has come but it also suits the fact we're going to turn away from, from the rising now. Like we're turning away from speaking to them. Their answer has come. That's the day you are sarcastic about. We're turning away back to real time. The future has been left behind, if you like. We're coming back into the argument again with, with these very people whom we were arguing with before we went into that journey through the rising. And the, we're going to see a, an interesting... Uh, carrying on of the imagery. So the imagery in this verse, the last verse about the rising was, on this day, we will put a seal over their mouths and their hands will speak to us and their feet will testify to all it is that they spent their time earning and acquiring of their actions. Now look at this, back into real time. A'udhu billah min shaitan rajim وَلَوْ نَشَاءُ لَطَمَسْنَا عَلَىٰ أَعْيُنِهِمْ فَاسْتَبَقُوا الصِّرَاطَ فَأَنَّا يُبَصِرُونَ Had we willed, we would have obliterated their eyes. And then they would have raised to the path. But how can they see anything? This is coming back into real time, the, the debate and dialogue between the believers and the Prophet وسلم, and between those who are arguing and opposing, saying, bring this on then. Is this real? Bring it on then. Bring it on now. Where is the threat? We can't see anything. That's how the question started. When they said, when is this promise? The idea was bring it on. If it's real, where, when is it? Why isn't it coming? And so now after showing them what the promise was, we're now being told if Allah wanted, they would have felt something very dire instantly. What is holding it back from coming to them instantly is the fact that Allah hasn't willed it yet. That's all. Had we willed, all of this would have, would have arisen. All of what's, what's coming in this verse. Meaning, they deserve it. Everything they had to do to deserve what's being spoken of, which we're going to come to, they've done. There's nothing holding it back. They fully deserve it. All that's holding it back is we haven't willed it yet. Had we willed, and it's coming in the present tense, meaning in any moment, in any moment, all we have to do is will it, and it's going to come, and they fully deserve it. What is this thing that's going to come? The next two verses are going to describe this. Had we willed, would have obliterated their eyes. They would race for the road, but how can they see it? And then again, had we willed, the very next verse, we would have deformed them on their spots. 
so that they would not at all be able to carry on walking, nor could they come back. This is the first part of the perfect imagery. So they're sarcastically saying, bring it on. And the verse is replying after describing that day that they were doubting, saying, we could do it today. Today, we could freeze them on their spots. Today, we can obliterate their eyes and they fully deserve it. It's just a matter waiting to happen, but we haven't willed it yet for a wisdom that's ours, i.e. to lead them on and to give time. Because of these people who are mocking the Prophet today, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will be those who will follow him tomorrow. Of the people who are mocking the Prophet today, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are those whose children will fight for the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tomorrow. And in fact, all of the children, all of the descendants of the opponents of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Mecca, the main opponents, those of them who live until the end, all of them are going to fight for Islam by the end of it and join the ranks with the Prophet ﷺ. So for an incredible wisdom, we haven't willed it yet, but they fully deserve it and it's coming. What do they fully deserve if we will? Now these two odd or interesting pictures, the obliterating of eyes and the freezing them on their spots, that's the first part of the mirroring. Because we said in the introduction, there are some people whose inner states are that their heads are held high. They can't even look at what's in front of them. And there's walls between them. And so the Quran started by saying that's the way they really are. Absolute prisoners of really bad choices. And if we wanted to, we could have treated them exactly as they are because that's what they deserve. The Quranic imagery is always built on the fact you will get exactly what you deserve. Not more and not less. You can get more of the good, like we said last time. But you'll get absolute justice, exactly what you deserve. And so it makes sense that if a punishment were to come to them today on the earth, it will be one that mirrors exactly the way that they are. And what is the punishment that mirrors exactly the way that they are so that if it were to happen today, it's absolute justice. These are the two images. The first of them is obliterating the eyes. So they can't see anything. Now the word uh, thumps literally means Absolute obliteration. In fact, it's just come to me right now. You know, the thing we call um, tipex, or Americans call it whiteout. Uh, in, in modern Arabic, they call it tamis from the same root, mean, meaning obliterator, the one that wipes it out. And so tamis means to completely efface. We would completely have effaced over their eyes. The word over is not necessary here. Uh, in the Arabic, that's why it actually wasn't translated in, into the English, and the verb doesn't need it either, but it's there to show absolute control. We would obliterate it over the eye, like the eye couldn't escape. And what's the obliteration? They say it means as if there's no eye there anymore. If you imagine just the forehead meeting the chin, and it's all flesh in between, there's nothing there that would be that would even look like an eye. If we willed, we would have obliterated their eyes. And what would they have done? When all of a sudden it's been blacked out, they would have raced. Uh, Sheikh Ali, my teacher, when he mentioned this verse, said, imagine there's a fire in a restaurant. Suddenly everyone's running to the door. So that, that, that's what the scene is. They, the, the thumps would happen to the eye. And all of a sudden in the panic, they all would have run, raced, you know, with extreme haste. You know, is, istibaq is racing with extreme haste. To where? To the sirat. What sirat are we talking about? Just, well, what does the word sirat mean? Sirat is that we said before, it's the wide road. It's the wide road used for, in imagery as the wide road of religion, outside of which there's nothing but, but being lost. And so they would have hastened to the wide road, the well-known road, the well-trodden road, the road they've always trodden on when they want to escape or go back to their homes, go back to what's familiar. They would have racened to the wide road. But how on earth? How is it possible that they can see anything? And so you get this image of rushing to escape to a road that's so easy to walk on normally. They've trodden on it all of their lives, but they can't see anything. This is like a present tense verb. Just picture the fact, how are they seeing? There's just nothing but panic. Nothing but panic. If we willed, would have, we would have done that to them today. 
look at the imagery because they refuse to follow the real sirat, the sirat of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And even the paltry, petty sirats that, that they trod on, even they will become unfamiliar to them. If the blindness that's in their spiritual sight were to be manifest on their real sight, perfect mirroring of the beginning and of the end. Had we willed, it comes again, even more so, they, they're hastening this on, O oh believers, but everybody just wait. Had we willed, nothing is holding back but will, then we would have done maskh to them upon their spots. Maskh in the Quranic parlance normally is about disfiguration. So it comes in, in other verses about disfiguring people, for example, into apes. Disfiguration. But the disfiguration in this context is not about becoming another kind of creature because it's about being frozen upon their spots. So had we will, we would have disfigured them on their spots in such a way that they would have had no ability to continue on wherever they were going and nor can they ever return. Again, present tense verb. Rujur, we've seen a lot in this surah already, the repetition of even vocabulary items in a variety of settings just to bring the images together. And so we've seen Yarji'un in a few ways, you know, when, when the people of previous peoples have been destroyed, we were told, oh, but they're not coming back. Again, they've left this earth. They're only going forward somewhere else. We, would, we saw the image in our last lesson that if they want to know how sudden the hour will come, it's going to come while they're arguing and they won't be able to go back to their homes again. You have to go on somewhere else. So again, the image will come here and the very last verse, very last word of this surah is turja'un, uh, again, from, from the very same verb. So just this imagery of return. You're not going to go back anywhere else except you're going to go back to him. And that's the very last scene of, of, of the entire surah. So the idea here is we will fixate them on their spot. So the, the disfiguration that's implied is some sort of making them into some kind of statues, making them fixated, unable to move, which is even greater than the last one because the last one was just about obliterating their eyesight and the ensuing panic when they can't even go on a familiar road. But even more so, we would have even done more than that. And they're fitting and worthy of this. And it suits exactly what they are is to literally fixate them on the spot. They can't do and they cannot neither do they have any ability at all to continue on wherever they are, nor can they ever present tense. I never, ever, as they try, will they ever be able to go back where they came from to their families just frozen on the spot. It's a perfect mirroring because we were told in the beginning of the surah, the internal states of these people is as such that there's just a tightly closed wall in front and behind. So they don't even grasp how it is to tread on the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they deserve it now. It's only being held back because we haven't willed it yet. So let them not hasten it. And oh, you believers, don't you um, be patient because the justice will come. And it can come now had we wanted. And from... And you can see the connection between this and the scene of the future, the scene that we just started from, because that scene was one of extreme control. The mouths are shut, the hands are speaking, the body has lost obedience to its owner, and it's in, instead its only obedience and loyalty is now to Allah alone. And so you can see the fitting transition from that scene of God's absolute control over their body to say yes. And in fact, we could have done it right now. And they're fitting of it. Let them not be too sarcastic. And from there, you get taken on now to an argument, a scene from what people always observe. They might, are they really thinking it far fetched that we would control their bodies in such a way instantly now, today? Is it really so difficult for us? Haven't they considered that whosoever we give a long life to, what do we do to that person? 
we literally, uh, tenkis means literally to turn something on its head, to literally invert something. Whoever among them is given a long life, we invert him in his khalq. We invert him in his, uh, translated as constitution. Haven't they used their intellects? If we look at um, old age, what is old age? If you see someone going through old age, you get this uh, disbelief when they see these legs, I used to race with them. This brain, I used to be the smartest guy. This mouth, I was the most eloquent person. People would listen to me. And when someone's going through the old age, they have to go through the realization that the limbs don't obey them as, as they used to. The limbs become feeble. The muscles wear away. The brain slows down. And for some people, the brain slows down to such an extent that it literally turns off. It's, it's as if you're dealing with a child right now. Doesn't remember anything, can't communicate properly, can't walk properly, can't go to the toilet by, by, by themselves. It's a really decrepit way of being, exactly where the person started from as a child. So what the verse is saying, can't you see it's evident in the cycle around you. Look at this Quranic theme. Look at the cycles around you. Look at the cycles in the universe. Look at the cycles in your own selves. Your strengths become nothing but helplessness. Your fingers stop obeying you. They, they won't obey you. They'll be shaking. You can't even use them. Your arms don't obey you. Your legs don't obey you. Your mind suddenly stops. Your tongue stops. Can't they see that we pull their powers away from them all the time. So how is it far-fetched that we should not be able to pull their powers away from them in this very moment? And they fully deserve it. So why are they mocking this? Why are they doubting our full power over this? In this moment today, and in that moment when they stand and the bodies don't obey them anymore. Of course it's possible. Afala yaqilun, and so you get this rebuking interrogative yeah you have the question do they see all of this and then not use their intellects all you need is a brain do they have no brains have they not thought about the cycle of everything and where everything is from and where everything is going and from there we go to the next key part of our Concluding section now. وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرَ وَمَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا ذِكْرٌ وَقُرْآنٌ مُّبِينٌ We have not taught him. Who's him? Who's him? There's no him. The him we're referring to is the him who was only mentioned in the first section, our, introdu our introduction explicitly. It's the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The argument has come full circle. It started off by saying, you really are one of the prophets. And this is the wise Quran from God. It's gone through its arc and it's come back now. He, the prophet, you know, the address is to all people whom he has come to. He came to warn us. He came to remind us. And so after taking us through that arc, all people are being told. This man, we did not teach him poetry. We have not taught him poetry. Uh, oh, hang on a sec. What happened there? Oh, our first technical problem for a while. Excuse me for a second. Let me try and figure this out. Okay, take two. No. Nope. Okay, good. Yeah, perfect. Wama uh, yam bagila. And this, and poetry is not something that even comes from him. He's never done poetry. He's never been a poet. He doesn't do poetry. 
uh, it's not fitting for him to be a poet. Rather, this, look at the other this, the two pronouns that refer back to the two key parts of our beginning, the message and the messenger. Rather, what is it that we've taught him? The thing that we've taught him is not poetry. And he is not a poet, and you all know that. What is that thing then that we've taught him? It is nothing. It is nothing at all except a dhikr and a Quran, mubin. So you can see the mirroring. This is the, the, indic the indication that we're coming to an end of, that, of the whole arc of this surah. The word dhikr came right at the beginning in our introduction, as did the word Quran, as the two names for this revelation. It was called dhikr, meaning remembrance itself, uh, because it's nothing but a reminder of what is familiar, of what makes sense, of what is your place in everything. Hikmah meaning putting everything into its place. And this recital, this is nothing but a, 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 a recital, a book that's preserved and transmitted through the human act of engaging with reciting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayer and in, and in this devotional act of connecting with Allah through his speech. It's nothing but that. It's nothing but a reminder in the heart and a recital on the tongue. It's nothing but clearly that. And it's not shi'ar. What's this idea of negating shi'ar? That the Arabs, their main literary forms were, were was main literary form really was poetry. And one of their accusations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because they struggled trying to categorize what the Quran was. And sometimes they would, and they would take it back to the three things that they were familiar with, which was the shi'r of the poets, you know, emotive speech to call to what themselves or their tribe, essentially, that's what the, the poetry was about. Or they might have called the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a soothsayer. He's a man of the jinn and the soothsayers had a particular kind of crude rhyming speech. And so sometimes said, oh, he's a kahin. This is just the crude rhyming speech of the kahins. But it wasn't really crude rhyming speech. So sometimes they would say, oh, he's a sorcerer, sahir. Because his words would have such effect, it would transform enemies to friends. It would transform uh, friends to enemies, meaning people who are allies to the idol worship suddenly standing with him against them. It, its transformative power was so palpable and so indescribable, it said, oh, he's a sorcerer. So these were the keen, the, the three key sort of accusations. And so here we're seeing the accusation of poetry. We're saying, no, no, this isn't poetry. This thing is nothing like poetry, nor is it fitting for him. Poetry never came from him. He never, he never learned that art. He never produced that form and you know it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose his prophet to be one who never undertook writing reading the high art forms of language just to make the case so decisive against his people. He is not one of the people of these art forms of, that you people have developed. This is something that's outside of all of the categories of your art forms. What is it then? It's but nothing but a dhikr and a Quran. And what's the connection of this to what immediately came in front of it? You can see how it goes right back to the beginning. This is a Quran, Hakim, and you are from the Mursaleen. This statement, ties the argument back to its loop. This is not shi'ar. This is not any of their art forms. It's nothing but the Quran. What in the immediate context brought this about or, or can bring this about is that the Quran is producing some incredible threats, threats of judgment day and the complete control of the bodies of these people on judgment day and threats that they are fully fitting of in this life. Uh, poets would say, aggrandize exaggerated statements. And so the Quran is reminding people, this is not poetry, guys. This is not flowery speech, guys. This stuff is real. So don't, don't just mark this off as, as exaggeration. What, we, what you've been told is real. The hell, the rising, the graves, the journey. It's not poetry. It's not exaggeration because poetry, all of it, or the best of it is lies because the best of it is, ex, is exaggerated. But rather this of it, this is the Qur'an. 
and he is the messenger. And why is this? And why was he sent with this recital for this purpose? Again, mirroring what we just saw right at the beginning. Liyunzira, liyunzira man kana hayyan wa yhiq al qawlu al kafirin. This man amongst you who was chosen for to bear this incredible recital to bring to you this incredible remembrance was sent only so that he could warn. Warn who? Whoever it is that's truly alive. Kana really and truly is alive. He was sent in order to warn whoever it is that's truly alive and to make the case decisive against the stubborn deniers. Kafirin is a noun here. So it's, it's referring to those who, if you like, are stubbornly entrenched upon the covering. When we said last time, kufr is to cover over the gratitude that's due to Allah, to cover over the realization that Allah is your Lord and the realization that this is the messenger of Allah. This is the speech from God. Kufr is covering over that knowledge and that realization. And the kafir, used as a noun, means the one who that's his fixed state, his immovable way. Al-kafirin, the stubborn deniers. Remember we said right in the introduction, the word has proven true. And so it's, re it's repeating that uh, introductory statement now. He's really only going to warn the ones who are truly alive. They're the ones who this book is going to be benefiting. As for the others, the book is going to make the case final against them. So that that pre-eternal qawl will come true. Who, what's the qawl? Whoever follows Satan will be with him in hell. And so this Quran is the ultimate criterion. It makes the case fitting and true and deserving against some. And it is the rope to real life to those who seek it and those who have it. And you can see how the Quran ch changes labels, plays with labels, and invites you to think about these labels. What does it really mean to be alive? And if the Quran is not the thing which is benefiting your heart, if the Quran is not the thing you turn to, to nourish you and to be nourished by, then you are not actually alive. There is no life inside of you. You are with the dead. And we saw right at the beginning of this surah, uh, the last verse of the introduction was, you will only warn the one who closely follows the remembrance and has awe of the all merciful unseen. So when you see the play on these labels, you can get the, the idea from just from this surah, what does it mean to be alive? It means to closely connect yourselves to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to carry with you an awe of the one who gives you all of these gifts. That's life. And that's what it means to walk on this earth. And with the full meaning of being a living being. Everything else is death. And now this the last section has br brought the main images all together now from the introduction. And so what you're going to find now in this concluding page, we've started the last page of the Mus'haf. In this concluding page, we're going to have some key arguments again to make the case absolutely decisive as we move towards the final statement of, of all, which is the return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, one second. Okay. Awalam yaraw anna khalaqana lahum mimma amilat aydina an'ama fahum laha malikun. Question. What kind of a question is it? Haven't they seen? If you say, don't you know that? The idea is, of course you know it. So why are you acting as if you don't? Haven't they seen? Of course they've seen. So why are they acting as if they haven't seen? And so it's establishing a fact 
and it's rebuking. Like, what's wrong with you? Haven't they seen? It's talking about the blessings of cattle. That the surah is taking you constantly within the world of the revealed signs and the world of the created signs, constantly moving between to show that the case is absolutely decisive. You will go back to your Lord. So coming back now between the revealed sign of the Quran and the dhikr to the created sign, the signs of Allah in the universe. Haven't they seen this is in the present tense? I, in a, it's, it's something that we should constantly be seeing and knowing and thinking about. What haven't they seen? What, what, what haven't they seen? Verily doubt it not. We, in our majesty, we created. I know one else but us. For their sake. No, lahum means for them. It's purely for them. And you can see why it's for them. Because it's made perfectly for them. Mimma amilat aidina. Of those things which our hands have wrought and made. What is it? An'am. Cattle. Na'am. This refers to you know, cows, sheep, goats, camels, livestock. Haven't they seen that we made for them livestock? And the word comes from ni'mah, meaning blessing. So there's so much blessings in these animals as we're about to see. فَهُمْ لَهَا malikun. And so what comes out of this is that they are really, truly owning them. They have full control over these animals. And this will continue on into the next verse. So we'll continue. But before we do that, this phrase, from that which our hands have wrought. The Quran uses this phrase to speak about um, the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates with almost to emphasize a special care or a special concern. So, for example, when Iblis does not bow to Adam, alayhi salatu was salam, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes him by saying, what's wrong with you that you didn't bow down to that which khalaqtu bi yaday, that which I created with my two hands. And here you have hands in plural. So it's, multi it's not two, it's multiple. Uh, and so many of the, of, the, of, the, of the Quranic commentators say this is a phrase which is used to show extreme care, a special creation, a creation for which um, an, a special concern from Allah has been shown in its, in, its, in its creation. To mimic the phrase used by people, if you see, for example, I'm, you know, if I'm running a factory or, or a, I'm a carpenter and I tell my customer, no, this one, I did it with my own hands. I didn't pass it on to anybody else. I did it by myself. I made sure I made it perfect. I made sure I made it right. So it's using this human phrase to show extreme concern and interest uh, with very particular creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Haven't they seen that we created for their sake from the many things we created with extreme concern? Uh, the heavens is also called halakna uh, bi'aydin. We've created them with hands. So we've, we've done this, we've wrought this with our hands, with our extreme concern. And some commentators prefer not to explain this phrase at all and just to say that what's being meant by the hands of God is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. Uh, while all agree, of course, that Allah is uh, exalted beyond any comparison to his creation at all. And so haven't they seen, we've created from them, from that which we've wrought with extreme care and concern, I, well, I should say special care and concern, these cattle that they are fully in control of, they fully own, وَذَلَّلْنَاهَا لَهُمْ فَمِنْهَا رَكُوبُهُمْ وَمِنْهَا يَأْكُلُونَ And we, in our majesty, have made these cattle so completely ذَلِيل ذَلِيل means completely humbled, abased, before them. فَمِنْهَا رَكُوبُهُمْ And so from these animals are their riding beasts. وَمِنْهَا يَأْكُلُونَ and from these animals, they eat. The humiliation of cattle is a, is a really 
remarkable thing if you were to think about it. So, you know, the, think of the camel and the cow. These are the most incredibly muscular creatures. They're huge, they're full of muscle. If you've ever slaughtered, you know, taken part in an Eid slaughter, if you look at this, just the leg of a cow, it's the same meat as the entire body of a sheep. Like it's, it's full of muscle. And yet they do whatever human beings want them to do. You know, they, they work on the farm. We just go, we just tug on the udders and we steal their milk. And the cow just sits there. A cow which is so strong allows us to take its milk. Uh, think of any other creature. Would we just be able to take its milk and it would just sit there for us to, to let us milk it? Uh, these animals are completely humbled and abased for our advantage. Or the camel, this incredibly powerful beast, and it just listens to us. It follows wherever we want it to go. We tie it down with a little string and it waits for us to, to come and ride it. It carries our burdens. Again, you know, for the desert Arabs, certainly, I mean, they wouldn't have been able to survive without these creatures carry their burdens all through the desert. And also us, you know, the, these teachings have reached us through all of these modes of, just think of them as modes of transport, right? Now, think of the camel, you know, that part of it. All this knowledge has come to us through people who've carried it through deserts, through civilizations and through time. Uh, all that we have, all of our learning is through men who've been served. And literally, if you want to focus on the rakub, which means literally riding mounts. Uh, it's quite remarkable. If you look at the sheep, uh, sheep are remarkable. If you've, again, have you ever taken part in an Eid slaughter? And I remember I saw a video of some gentleman online talking about this. Um, someone from Texas, I can't remember now, saying how the sheep, sheep are completely subdued for slaughter, for ritual slaughter. Because what if you really take part in it, if you, if you hold on to the sheep and you just lay it down on its side, it actually lays down. Uh, if you do it properly, if you soothe it, you know, if you do it on, on the way of the sunnah, you know, which is that you hide, hide all blades from it, you hide all scenes of any blood from it, you lie it down. And I, I've taken part in this. It literally just lies down waiting for you. It's not fighting. It's not kicking. It's just in full surrender, full uh, submission. And so these livestock, which are really the basis for most people's uh, food, if you think of, you know, the milk, the meat, and we're going to come to, I'm going to, I'll, I'll let the verse explain it. Uh, the riding mounts, this is, this is a noun. The idea is they are a mount for you whenever you wish to use it. Yet kulun is in the present tense because we are constantly eating uh, from the meat of these creatures. Very meaty, very muscular, very powerful in complete submission to us. And we have full control over them. And for them, in these creatures are untold ad advantages. Manafir, it's undef indefinite and it's pluralized. So you can say untold advantages they enjoy in these creatures. As if the creature is just like a like a, a treasure chest, and you just go inside and you find so many things that, that you can use. Uh, just, just think about their hides. You know, cow hide, you know, is the leather that for the, for the desert Arabs, certainly, when they traveled, the only flask they could take water in was the, was the, was the hide, it, it was leather. How could they travel without the skins of these animals keeping their water? Their armor, a lot of their armor, they didn't often have chain mail in their wars. They did, they certainly, again, if you start, first of all, the people of the, of the desert and other primitive people, you know, other people who didn't have the civilization that brought together the chain mail and the armor and the very advanced, you know, metal protection. Leather was the main protection they had if they wanted to protect themselves in war or carry their swords or carry their, you know, they couldn't defend their civilizations without the hides of these very powerful animals completely in surrender to them. Think of the wool, uh, the wool, which is for so many, you know, again, if you look at all of these animal herding civilizations of Central Asia, the people of the desert, people who live in the most cold climates, again, human civilizations who've brought, you know, we are from their offspring, you know, people for the centuries, how have they survived? It was the hides of these creatures that would keep them warm. In the, in, the, in the extreme cold of winter. And so 
there is these animals are stores of untold treasures. And amongst these advantages, which are singled out because they're so incredible, is the masharib, the drink. This animal is a source of drink walking around. You don't have to go to a well. And it allows you just to tug away at its udders. It won't kick back. Although if it wanted to, it would kill you. I mean, it's way more muscular than you. It just lets you tug away at its udders. And the beverage of milk, and it's pluralized because they're all different types of milk, camel milk, sheep milk, cow milk, each with its own flavors, with its own advantages. And it's of the, the very best of foods. Again, think about very simple uh, civilizations, certainly village people, even today, milk is their main sustenance. It's just milk. They wouldn't always have meat to eat. Uh, the crops might come and might not come, but as long as you have a she camel or a she cow or a she sheep, uh, you know that you can keep your, your kids alive. It will let you tug away at its milk and you can drink its milk and you can turn it into butter and you can turn it into cheese. And we enjoy that. We are unfortunately just remote from the source. I mean, how many of us wouldn't know how to, how to handle, we just came through a, uh, we, we just came out of a, a period of extreme shortages in the supermarkets. How many of us were panicking, oh, th there's no milk. And suddenly we have to completely change how we think of our, our food. Oh, there's no butter. Um, so we need these animals as much as they did, but the, in the factor of modern life, we've just forgotten. We think milk comes from a bottle and the bottle comes from a supermarket. And Allah is saying, no, your sust, it's just like, and it really is remarkable if you think about it. I mean, this huge animal is there just so that you can survive and it will do whatever you tell it to do. Uh, it's a, it's a really is a miracle. You just have to think about, you know, on your own. It's, an, it's just a miracle. And so that's why the rebuking question comes at the end. It started off with the question, haven't they seen this? Why are they acting as if they haven't seen this? Can't they then, do they not then, after seeing all of it, not show constant thanks, present tense verb? We owe to Allah constant thanks. Is this really coming out of chaos? That out of chaos, boom. This animal is there with all this treasure chest so humans can survive in the most harshest of climates. Is it coming out of nowhere? Or is this not the hand, the same hand that we saw last time, the hand that governs the whole of the earthly sky so we can survive in our days and our nights? The very same hand that sent down the rainwater and brought out crops from the earth. Are they really so dumb? so devoid of intellect to see that that's the hand. It's the caring hand. It's the hand that wants them to survive. It's the hand that wants them to be nourished, not nourished in a poultry ways, but in beautiful ways. The meat of these animals, the milk of these animals, the butter and cheese of these animals, the warm clothing of these animals. Can't they, what's wrong with their brains? That they're acting as if their eyes can't even see. Can't they see all of that and show real, deep, perpetual thanks to the one? And that's why the emphasis on he, he created these with special concern. Bi'aydin. Bi'aydina. Our hands. Why is it for special concern? For that child of Adam who was created by the special concern of Allah. This was made perfectly for you. Why aren't you showing thanks? And what's the essence of thanks? is to acknowledge that these gifts are really are from that one. And then to lower ourselves before him. That's what ibadah is. Ibadah is nothing but thanks to God. Lowering yourself before him and acknowledging this. But look how ugly is their response to this incredible blessing that they live day in, day out, they're animals. Not only do they not do this, but look at this. Wow, and Aubrey translate this nicely. Wow means and, but it's not a regular and. It's the and of saying, of, of, uh, of an odd uh, juxtaposition. Like I'm doing this for you, and then you hit me, and then you insult me. It's the and of this very odd, unfitting, unseemly juxtaposition. And after all of that, the clear sign that's in front of them, it takhadu. It means to take for yourself. 
It implies effort, like they really put effort into this to take a God for themselves. And it shows that if you take the God, it's not really a God. A God is not someone you take. He takes you. He made you. He can do what he wills with you. You're not the one that takes him. You don't, you don't make him into who he is. He makes you into what you are. But these people took gods for themselves, they exerted effort to find something which was not the one. Again, here's Allah, the name of absolute majesty, which has only come, I think, two or three times in the surah. Other than Allah, the one who made and created and gave, they passed him by, min dunillah, other than him, they passed him by and they exerted effort to find a whole host of these paltry gods. And indef you know, indefinite here meaning these gods, many and, and, and insignificant for themselves. Why? لَعَلَّهُمْ يُنصَرُونَ Because they, they had a hope that they would find their support and their aid in these people. So these, you know, the Arabs of Quraysh, certainly they didn't believe in any afterlife. So all of this myriad of gods uh, and the hierarchy that they invented and they devoted themselves to was just for in this life, if something goes wrong, they will help them. It shows this need they had. Uh, they had a sense of their weakness, this human weakness. But instead of directing it to Allah, instead of feeling any need to show thanks, they just created their own multiplicity of hierarchy, i.e. Their, their thanks becomes to themselves because they created the hierarchy and their surrender is to themselves because they wanted it to be emanating from them. And the victory they will see to seek is in the things they've created for themselves. Modern man is no different. Uh, if you look at all the hierarchies we've created, and you know, the, the main replacement for God in many ways for some contemporary writers is this hierarchy of the nation state. The nation owns you. You are sons of the nation. You will die for the nation. Again, this uh, drumbeat is more in a time of war, but there's a particular underlying, underpinning idea that underlies how we live in the modern world, how we think of law and order, how we think of surrender. And it's all to this abstraction that we've created and the abstraction is controlling us. Same with the financial system, actually. We've created an abstraction, which is this particular conception of debt, and now it's controlling us, and we're all slaves to it. And so modern man is no different. He's, he didn't want to surrender to God and be free. He instead wanted to surrender to something of his own abstraction and creation, and he's completely subordinate to it. And this thing can't help them. And in doing so, they've now created an entire system of education that doesn't need God. What does education need? Surrender to the nation state, follow this order. Anyway, it's a, it's a long conversation, but the point is education, work, the banks, the money, the whole order is self-sustaining and it's kicked God out because God used to be there in, even in these countries. But in the rise of the new order, God was kicked out altogether. There is no God that's running Christian Europe. What's running Europe is the same person running all of these countries. It's the abstractions of people. And so modern man is no different then. He takes something to give it this position and to surrender to it in the hope that it will suffice him all of his needs and concerns and that he doesn't have to owe God anything. But then we're told, لا يستطيعون نصرهم وهم لهم جندم محضرون but these idols or these gods they've taken have no ability perpetually, present tense. They have no ability at all to come to their aid. Despite the fact that, there's a few ways you can look at the pronouns here. But one way is you can say, despite the fact that these worshippers of idols, وَهُمْ لَهُمْ جُنْدٌ مُحْضَرُونَ They are, for them, an army present. There's a few ways you can render this. One way, and Aubrey kept, you know, it's this they and them, who's they and them. One is idols and one is the, the people. One way you can connect this is to say that these idols can't help them at all, even though these people are gathered day and night in the service of these idols. You know, some, some people believe in feeding them. Some people believe in other ways of guarding them. And so they've gathered together as gods, 
So they've handed over so much effort to these constructions of their own hands, which can't help them at all. And the one who's given them everything, they've turned away from him altogether. So you see the complete insanity of this juxtaposition. They've handed over so much of themselves to something they've abstracted it, they've created it, and it can't do anything for them. And the one who's already done everything for them, they're just not interested. This is the odd juxtaposition. The other way to work with the pronouns is, uh, is to look at it as a scene of the next life, that all these idols will come on judgment day and people will say, hey, come help me, help me. And they will not help them at all. And then at the end of the, that day, all of them will be ushered off to the same, uh, to the same end place. So whether the idols come together as an army, they can't help them, or whether the people go to their idols as an army seeking help, they can't help them. So whoever you want to have, we want to look at the pronouns. They are armies gathered for them, whether the idols come as armies to help them, or the people go as armies to serve the idols. This is an abstract, this is, this is people supporting themselves with what they've created. There's nothing in it. There's no substance in it. There's no support in it. There's nothing for them and they've left behind the one who made them. And so that's why then the Quran says, so that little detour in the conclusion is again, a summary, clear, distinctive argument for the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they've turned away from that. And then it speaks to the prophet again, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, back to this, the, the mood of, the, of this conclusion, the message and the messenger. So it says, فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ قَوْلُهُمْ إِنَّا مَا يُسِرُّونَ وَمَا يُعْلِنُونَ And so it's saying, so don't be saddened by their words. Whatever the words we've seen in this surah, the immediate indication was about the poetry. He's just a poet. Allah is saying, don't be saddened by them. Don't let that grieve you. This will not go, this is not unwritten. Justice will come. Don't, we are with you. So don't let it hurt you. My will hasn't come yet, but it's coming soon. Or there are other words. There are words against Allah. Allah cannot, Allah is powerless. And no, they need these statues. These statues are the real gods. They're turning away from the oneness of Allah. Don't let that hurt you. Or there are words that Allah cannot bring the dead back to life. Or there are words, they're threatening words. If you go a bit further back in, this, in, this, in the story we saw in lesson two, these harsh words, we're going to stone you. You guys are liars. These are all words that said to the Prophet وسلم, in different ways. Allah is saying, all these words that have been implicit and explicit in this surah, don't let any of that grieve you. And this is an extension from the Prophet وسلم, It's also saying that to all the believers as well. You know why? Because in every time and place, the job of the believers, as the surah concludes, is the job of that man in Surah Yasin. It's to call people to the messengers. What did the man do in Surah Yasin? He, he only had two messages. One was, these really are prophets. Look at them. They're so excellent and honest and true and asking for nothing. And his next message was, how can I not worship the one who made me? There's no other way to live in this life. And so believers, we carry on from generation to generation, the message of the messenger. And as we do that, the same forces that fought the messenger and called him names and tried to put out what he brought, the believers will face as a group all of the same forces. And sometimes they'll be threatened and some of them will be killed and some of them will be called names and some of them will be looked with suspicion. Some of them will be looked with half-hearted, sarcastic, you know, they accept them, but they don't accept them. And so the believers will face a share of what the prophets have faced because they've stood along with them. And so just like Allah is telling the prophet, وسلم, he's telling everyone with him as well, don't be saddened. It's okay. I'm with you. Be strong. Especially if you remember this time in, in this, is, this surah came in the middle of the, of, of the Meccan phase of the prophet's mission. And the Meccan phase, especially towards the middle of it, there was a lot of hardship the believers were facing, especially those who weren't supported by a strong tribe. You know, you had people who were tortured. Uh, some were actually killed from torture. And, and, and Allah forbade them from fighting back. They were not allowed to fight back. They, all they were allowed to do for that 13 years was to bear it with patience. And so in that time, it was a difficult time. 
and the unbelievers are jeering and calling them names. And these people are saying, no, the promise is coming. And Allah is saying, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Just hold on there. I haven't willed it yet. And they deserve all of it. And I'm with you. And so a lot of the surat Yasin, a lot of the Quran is just giving the believers strength. that It's okay, I'm with you. The, the destiny will be unfolded. And don't worry, justice will be done. No one who hurts you is going to walk away, walk away without having to account for what he's done to you. <inaudible> Verily, we doubt it not, we know. Ma, whatever it is that they are keeping in secret, whatever schemes or plots or whatever they're doing to hurt you, we know all of their secret. And we know everything that they declare in public. The secret came first, just to show that I know their secret, let alone their public. It's as easy for me to know their secrets as it is to know what, what, what they reveal to everybody. I know everything. And it's being said with majesty. We know, we in our majesty know everything. Nothing is hidden. And therefore, what's, what's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? Then they will have to account for it. Justice will be done. Don't be saddened. Don't be saddened. And from there, it goes to another, another argument. And this argument will reach, take the surah to its absolute um, um, yeah, I can't, the, the word escaped my mind. The tempo will be increased, 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 increased till it reaches its absolute conclusion now. So we're in the final stretch of this conclusion. But it's an argument for what now, from here all the way to the end, of the other thread that's at the heart of the Quranic message, which is the oneness of God, which the argument of the camels were connected to, or of the cattle that we started with, which was the thanks that are due to him and that he is one. The other thread, of course, is that he will bring you back and there will be judgment and you will all meet him. And so the second part, which is the two things the messenger has brought. And so the messenger was affirmed in this conclusion. The last part of what he's brought, the very last section in our verse 12 of our introduction becomes the last part of our conclusion. And so this is the beginning of the argument for the end now. Again, this question of fact, why are you acting like you don't know? Of course you've seen. Why are you acting like you haven't seen? Shame on you for, for being like that. The wow, again, is this odd juxtaposed state. If you look at the entire surah, which has taken us through the stories of the prophets and the sun and the moon and the trees and the, the moving imagery of Judgment Day, has man seen all of that? and still argues about us concerning our power to bring him back, has he seen all of that? And then the human being. You know, the, the Quran has taken us literally to the two signs, almost in equal measure, the power of the revealed signs and the clarity of the created signs. And so as it draws to its close, it draws back to the most immediate of Allah's created signs which is you yourself and me myself. The last thing it wants to end on is look at yourselves. Awalam yaral insan, this species called human being, has it not seen? Does he not see regularly himself? What about himself? Anna khalaqnahu min nutfatin. That verily we, in our majesty, we created him. No one else did. We did it. From what? From a nutfa. Nutfa just means literally a small piece of water, a small amount of water. They would say in classical Arabic, it's the amount of water that's left in a, in a container. You know, you pour it out. There's a little bit is left. They call that nutfa. And it's used to mean the, the sperm dropped, you know, released uh, the sperm drop. Uh, in the sexual act, it's a very small amount that gets released. It's a very, very, very small fluid, indefinite, you know, really small, paltry fluid. We made him, 
from this paltry fluid. And then lo and behold, all of a sudden, he is a khaseem, mubeen. Noun sentence, you know, his absolute state. Khusuma in Arabic means, uh, Khusuma in Arabic um, means the most extreme kind of uh, disputation. We saw it earlier in, in our last lesson. We saw in our last lesson the verse that when they said, when is this time going to come? The first response was, it's just going to be a scream or a cry and it will seize them while they are wahum yakhsimun while they are in extreme dispute over some of their worldly matters so khusuma is extreme and avid uh, disputation and so allah is, so the, the first thing if you don't move on we can just say this mark of again the handiwork of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that each and of each of us everyone listening to these words everyone who's heard these words you know since their revelation every person came from a most insignificant piece of fluid to become this fully grown being fully sane fully intelligent fully articulate fully capable to really get engrossed in argumentation so first of all it's just this shift of the paltriness of his origin to this fully capable being that he is now to show the uh, the um, first of all, just the 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 gift from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, from the poultry to the huge, and then it highlights the extreme kufr or the 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 denial of God that can't you see in your own self? You came from nothing to this amazing thing. Isn't that a mark of His handiwork, His care, His concern, His raising you literally? through these stages and that he can bring you back to, to life. I mean, the one who created man from this fluid, why can't he create you again after you've become bones? It, it doesn't make any sense. Where's, where's this mark of the impossibility of that? And so in it then is the argument, of course he can bring you back to life. Just look at how he made you in the first time. It's no less amazing. And then speaking about this khusuma, what is the khusuma, this argument that these people are giving, forgetting where they came from? And in his disputation, he strikes an example. And again, you'll be seeing even just the mirroring of, of language as well. We saw Darbul Mathal right at the beginning. We were told, that was the first verse after the section we called the introduction. Strike for them an example, the example of the people of the town. And so here, these people are striking their own examples, examples about Allah, and they're so unfitting. And he strikes for us, you know, us in our majesty. He strikes for us a most unworthy example. What's the example he makes from Allah? He compares Allah to people. He compares Allah to his creation. What an unfitting example that was. When he says, Man Who on earth is there that will bring these bones back to life after they've become Ramim? Ramim means they've decayed after the long passage of time. They're just falling apart just because time has worn them out. Most of many of the commentators mentioned that, that this connects to an incident as well. Uh, most of them say was a man called Umayya ibn Khalaf. Umayya ibn Khalaf was the slave owner of Bilal, uh, a very important uh, Muslim. He was later on freed and became the, the mu'adhin, the, the caller to prayer of the Prophet. And Umayya ibn Khalaf used to torture Bilal in the son of, the, of Mecca under the desert, under a rock, uh, to convert back to Islam, just to prove a point that I'm stronger than this slave and I'll bring him back to, to leaving this religion. But Bilal was greater than him and he would just say, Ahad, 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 until this Umayyah was humiliated amongst his friends because he couldn't, he was, he was weaker than, than, than the slave. He, whatever he did, the slave wouldn't become Muslim. And in the end, Abu Bakr bought Bilal and freed him. So many of the commentators say, Umayyah bin Khalaf, this man, 
and he died in the battle of uh, Badr. Uh, he is the one who came to the Prophet وسلم, just to mock him and make fun of him and say, hang on, are you really saying this bone? And he just sort of just scattered it to the winds. Uh, God is really going to bring that back to life. Like, what, what is this nonsense? Uh, and the report of the, the, the Mufassirin mentioned, the Prophet said, وسلم, وسلم, yes, he will bring them back. He, he made you, he will take your life, he will bring you back, and he'll put you in, in hell. Uh, for his mocking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so and in the middle of all of that is the is the stark contradiction nasiya khalqahu he forgot his own creation he forgot where he came from he strikes this paltry similitude for us and he forgot where he came from if he remembered where he came from he wouldn't have said this Man ramim. And again, just like we saw earlier, it's a sarcastic question. He's not really asking who will do it. He's really saying this is preposterous nonsense. It's ridiculous. It's gone to nothing. And these bones, with the long passage of time, what happens to them? You know, the actual v- v- uh, phrasing is who will bring bones to life? Bones... You know, are bones living or dead? It's a funny question Muslim jurists had actually debated. But the question here is, you know, bones which are fresh, there's, uh, there's, there's life in them. You know, there's moisture in them. There's, you know, there's a, well, life comes through them, of course. You know, within them is, you know, the marrow and, you know, all of the blood. But even the dead thing we call the bone, there's just full of this life. They're moist. But with the passage of time, they become worn out, completely dry, dry, devoid of moisture, devoid of anything that looks like life. And then you just crumble them away. He's saying this is the most ridiculous nonsense. He's not really asking who's going to do it. But the surah, again, is going to grab that question. Which question? This one. He's saying, who on earth is going to do it? And that surah is going to say, you want to know who? That one. He, he, he. He, 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 and then the surah is going to end. And it's going to speak about Allah. It's going to argue its case in a more and more emphatic way. Meaning the one who made them, the one who does this, the one who does that, the one who does that, that one. And when it pulls out to that one, then the surah reaches its absolute um, peak of its, of, its, of its tempo. And it reaches its absolute height uh, with its conclusion. Who is the one? I'll tell you the one. That's the one. Qul, say to him. And this is the reference to the messenger. The messenger is delivering this, this message. Uh, and so this is speech given to the messenger and it will end with Allah, the all-powerful. Qul, say, answer that sarcastic question. Don't let it go. Yuhyiha. He will give them life. الَّذِي أَنشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةَ وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ Like I said, it will keep answering he, 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 going bigger and bigger and bigger uh, to answer this uh, question. He will give them life. Who? First of all, the one who أَنشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةَ That's the most obvious answer. Hang on. Uh, the bones didn't come from a supermarket, genius. You know, the bones, there was a fluid. There was no bone. Isn't it more complicated to bring the bone out uh, than the fact there already was a bone and it's coming back into its new life? So first of all, there's no sense in this, in this argument. So this is the most clear and obvious answer. The one who did insha of them. And there's, by the way, three verbs that we'll be talking about the creation over here. Ihya is about giving life. And then insha, nasha, we use it in modern Arabic just to mean almost like upbringing. I'll say, for example, nasha tu fi amman. I might say, you know, I, my upbringing was in Amman or in London or in somewhere. So the idea of, of nasha is, is the slow growth that something goes through. And then khalq means, of course, creation. So three different verbs almost about these, about the bringing to life. So say, he will bring them to life. Who? 
the one who. And just a point, the one who, الذي, the Quran uses this a lot to give an argument. Because you could have simply said, Yuhiha Allah. That's what it means. Allah will give them to life. That's the answer. But instead of saying Allah, but you say the one who, it allows you to bring an argument out. And so the Quran uses the one who a lot when speaking about Allah to bring an argument that connects to what that passage is uh, discussing. So he will bring them to life. Who? The one who nurtured them in this slow growth the very first time. Awwala marra, the first time around. And the use of first obviously implies, hang on, if there's a first, then why can't there be a second? Rather, the word first means second. You'll never have a first if there's no second after it. And so there has been a first. And in that first, it went through such a slow growth of fluid and then cells and then division and then the extreme miracle that all of us went through. The miracle when no one was there in that womb but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all of the way, taking us through the stages, the Rabb, stage after stage, who did insha, the slow growth of the bone, and then you came out, and then it, the bones were weak and supple. If you lie down too much on one side, your, your, your face will get deformed. So, you know, the baby comes out very supple, and the bones took, went through their full growth, and he's the one who did that the first time, and the first implies the second. Why can't he do it again? What a nonsense of an objection. And then we're going to go out further. So of course he can do it. Because the, the, the fact is, وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٌ He, with every kind of creation, is fully, fully knowing. Nothing escapes his knowledge. With every kind of creation. خَلْق literally means the act of creating. Often is used to mean the thing created, just like in English. And again, it's been captured fairly well here. Creation, we use it to mean an act. We also use it to mean the thing created. So same with the Arabic. He is aware, first of all, everything created because he, he has made it. His knowledge covers everything. The fact of creation implies knowledge. Uh, the one who took you from that fluid to what you are today is the one who is aware of the intricacies of everything because there's nothing more intricate than you. And no one to this day can understand how you function, really how your brain functions. Really, we're, the human being is a mystery to the human being as of this moment, and he will continue. And so the creation of man, let alone the creation of everything else, uh, necessitates that the one who created man is the possessor of an incredible knowledge, the knowledge of all of the intricacies that creation implies. So he is fully knowing of all of creation, and the fact of creation, the bringing about of every kind of a thing, he has absolute knowledge. Alin means permanent, unchanging, absolute knowledge. Uh, again, and, that, and it connects to this theme of the, of, the, of the brittled bones. Okay, the bones have scattered. Okay, and he doesn't know where they are. He doesn't know where, where every atom is. He's not the one that sustains every electron. Well, what are you talking, haven't you seen already? What will answer your own question? He knows everything. Of course, he'll bring them back. And when he brings them back, he's, he can create the bones. He can give them a life through which they can go through a slow growth. He's done all, that's what he's done for your bones already. He created, he put life into it, and he gave it a beautiful growth. Of course, he'll do it. And you've seen all of that already. Alladhi, you want to know who? I'll tell you who. Alladhi. And another, it's so amazing, the, uh, the imagery of, again, we're, we're going through this exploration of, of, of nature again. You know, you get this idea how much the Quran wants your consciousness to be with the world and with Allah constantly. Because the world is that thing which always points to the one who made it. Every act points to its actor necessarily. If you hear words, okay, it's pointing towards someone who spoke them. You see words written, okay, it's pointing towards someone who's written them. So this world is the act of God. And you're meant to be seeing and beholding and having a relationship with the actor in the act. So this constant interplay between the revealed sign and the created sign. And the tree is something which has come before. So it's an interesting development of an earlier 
image that was that were, that came out twice actually in the trees and also in the shape of the moon compared to a tree. الذي جعل لكم من الأشج من الشجر الأخضر نارا فإذا أنتم منه توقدون the one who he made for your sakes لكم from the green trees fire and lo and behold you regularly present tense verb are fueling your fires with it iqad you know iqad means to to light a fire and fuel it to keep it going what is this a reference to there's an immediate reference the immediate reference is to how the desert arabs used to make their fires there's a really nice video actually uh, six minute video someone showing how they would in the primitive uh, certainly how the arabs would would describe their fire making uh, maybe in the YouTube description, we can share a little video. Unfortunately, the audio for that is in Arabic. Inshallah, you'll find others in English. Uh, they would have two trees, al-marh wal afar, and they describe them as masculine and feminine. And this, and they would uh, rub them together. And in the rubbing, you would be you would produce these very hot ashes, and then the hot ashes you would move to something which is flammable, maybe, maybe, maybe dry wood. And then you'd blow it and suddenly you would have a fire. And that would be the only way they would survive, certainly when, when traveling. Um, and so imagine this amazing thing. And again, we are humans today because people before us had to live like this. If we don't experience it today, we are still the benefactors of all of this. And it's a shame that we don't experience this today. Uh, we would be only the more closer and more fresh to, to appreciate all of this. Because literally you're traveling and you have nothing and you would die without the ability to be warm uh, and to have light to scare away the animals and to be able to cook food. Uh, and literally you would just go look for a tree and this tree, you know, the amazing thing is when the tree is green, when it's moist, it's actually wet and you break it off and you do your little act and lo and behold, you've made fire. Water and fire, you'd think they're opposites. And we're being told, no, in the very moist, wet tree branch, we made fire for them so that they wouldn't die in, in the desert from their cold and from their hunger. And it's the absolute uh, image of what he was, what this image is, a dry bone. It's not moist, it has no life. How will it come to life? Then we say, okay, look at what you do all the time. You have a wet branch and you uh, treat it in a particular way and suddenly you have the hot fire. Aren't these opposites as well? Does fire come from water? And this harkens back to, again, to a linguistic usage we saw right at the end of the story in chapter two. What was the last verse in chapter two in lesson two that we had? It was the story of the people of the town. We were told it wasn't, an army that destroyed them, it was just a scream. And then, خامدون, a scream came to them and their fires went out. Remember I said the khumud literally means when a fire dies and was used as a symbolism or, or metaphoric expression for life. Life is like you're lively, like fire. And the punishment came and the fire died out and, and they were dead. And so that imagery that was hearkened at the beginning is being summoned at the end. If he can bring fire from water, life is like fire. And the brittle is like what is not life. And, it, and just like fire can come from that wet branch, life can come from these, from these dead bones. So again, it's calling you always. Why can't you use your brains? It's as simple as that. Why are they not reflecting on what's there? This is the same hand, the hand that cares for them. And that hand is... It's, it's like a no-brainer. Obviously, he can bring them back. In addition to the other moral argument that the Quran has, that justice is fulfilled only by bringing them back. And so the end course of man, if he reflects on his moral nature and the order of the universe, is that he must come back. So his two arguments always come hand in hand, is the ability of God to bring it back and the fact that the conclusion of the story of man is only in his coming back. And then God's plan is perfect. If you look at the order of everything, everything is with hikmah, hakim. Everything's in its place. So why should man not be in his place? 
meaning people do wrong and they die laughing and people are wronged and they die as victims. The order of everything dictates that this story isn't over yet. Something more is coming. So the argument for the resurrection in the Quran follows these basic ideas. The world has order, God has order, man has order, man has conscience. Justice isn't felt in this life. Justice has to happen. And he's fully capable of doing it. There's no doubt about it because he's done it the first time in an amazing way. The other thing, if you step back from this sign of, of the green tree, is something that modern writers reflect upon, which is if you really think about iqad, iqad means fueling your flames. How do we fuel our flames? Whether it's flames in factories, whether it's flames uh, you know, in, in car engines, whether it's fuel, how do you fuel heat? However we do it, how do we do it on planet earth? It's only one way. Okay, I'm, I'm a bit confused now because you can generate electricity with, with uh, magnets perhaps as well. So if we stick with maybe the imagery of fuel then, uh, it's only one way. And what is that one way? It's from the photosynthesis of green plants. Were it not for the fact that green plants exist on this earth, we will not be fueling anything. Because all of that oil, you know, where, where is it from? Is it from the animals who have been consumed by the earth, the energy of animals, where does it come from? It always comes back to the sun. And the medium between the sun and all of life on earth and all the energy I'm using to speak and you're using to listen, all that energy is from the green tree or the green leaf. The green is the intermediary between everything without which there is no life and there is no energy, no flames in you, the flame of life, no flames in animals, the flame of life and no flames, whether from the burning of any of the fuels that, that, that we use. So it's a, it's a powerful image in how we read it uh, in, a, in a modern lens and how they would have read it in a pre-modern lens, uh, the sign of God in, in the green tree. Okay, so now we're pulling out. Like I said, Allah is referring to himself in a greater and greater and greater way. Question. This question is, uh, don't you know the answer? Of course you know the answer. So it's, it's, a, it's the question here is just to show the answer is obvious and you know it. After seeing all of that, is not the one. Remember we said the one who is coming again. You want to know who? You want to know who? That's who. I'm going to tell you who. Is not the one who. He made the heavens and the earth. We're moving out now from your water. We're moving out now from your tree. And from your fire, we're moving out, we're zooming out. Is not the one he made from nothing, all of the heavens and the earth on which you walk. Is he not absolutely able? You know, Qadir is a noun, this extra ba, which is not translatable. They say it's just there for emphasis, but it's not necessary for the, for the, uh, for the sentence. It's there to add an extra emphasis. Is, is he not absolutely fully capable? Upon, because he upon to mean absolute control, is not fully capable upon this fact. What is it? To create the likes of them. Showing that, why say to create the likes of them? It's, it's belittling them. It's like saying, he made all of this. He can't make the likes of you. Like you're nothing. You're small. You're paltry. You fill what? Five, five feet, six feet? What are you? You're nothing. So let alone the fact he made you the first time, let alone the fact that he gave you, you know, the, the interesting imagery of what's like it, you know, fire coming to wood, dead wood coming to fire, wet wood coming to fire, that you've seen something very similar that you use all the time. It's familiar to you. Forget all of that. You're nothing. You're nothing in the big order. Of course he can do it. What a silly supposition. And so then, 
the answer comes immediately. Bala, bala is the answer to a negative question. If I say, like, am I not your dad? The answer is, if, if the answer is yes, the answer is bala. Yes, of course you are. So bala is how to negate the, the, the negative question. Is this not true? Bala means, of course it's true. So isn't he the one who created the heavens and the earth capable fully to make the likes of them? Bala, of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. And he is the absolute creator. Khalaq, this pattern fa'al in Arabic uh, implies extreme, extreme expression of the act, lots of repetition. So it's often used in Arabic for professions. Like a carpenter is called najjar. He's always doing his carpentry. That's what a, a profession is. Uh, khabbaz is baker, tabbakh and so on. So professions are often on this pattern, fa'al, because it shows it shows constant practice. And Allah is khalaq. There's a constant expression of his khalq, constantly. Things are constantly coming into creation. Things are constantly born and dying. Things are constantly being sustained. In every moment, you're being sustained. Because if he didn't sustain you, poof, you would, you would go. He is... His act of creation is constant. It's all around you. Of course, he can bring them back to life. And he's completely alim. He, and this pattern, fa'il, shows a permanent state. He's constantly knowing. Nothing escapes his knowledge. And therefore, there's nothing that he can't make. There's nothing that he doesn't, he's not aware of. He can make everything. There's two verses left as we go closer and closer now, higher and higher. The majesty of the one that they dare turn away from. <laughs> His command, it is showing how easy it is now, the act of creation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he wants something to exist, it's only, the word only, yes, it wasn't translated here, means it's really simple for him. It's nothing but his command when he wants something to be, either arada shay'an, anything at all, when, when he wants it, when he wants a thing, anything at all to be, his command is nothing more than he says to it, be. And then it bees, right? And then it becomes. He says to it, be, and then it becomes. This phrase is used a few times within the Holy, a number of times within the Holy Quran to show the ease of the act of creation. If you want to know how all of this came to be, it came about with no effort whatsoever. All he did, he willed it, and it became. He said to it, be, and then he became. This, this phrase, kun fayakun, comes a lot. It shows the ease of, of, of the creative act for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, some scholars interpret this in a sort of literal, not you can say a sort of literal way, in the sense that there is a sort of instruction. Or, or before we get to that, actually, it, in this image, Allah is, is addressing the thing. He says to it, be. And then it becomes as if it already has a sort of presence somewhere. And that presence somewhere is in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a lot of, uh, I'll just say for philosophizing, mystics and philosophers have, have made a lot out of this idea that everything that came to be was present, was present in the mind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, present in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he directed his will to it, and it came out in, into reality. From his knowledge into, uh, into, the, into the outside world. This speech to that item of knowledge, B, uh, some scholars interpret it as there really is a form of speech, which obviously befits Allah, not a, not a speech that resembles the speech of people. But there's a, there's, a form of what, there's a form of address, come out, and it comes out. And others interpret this entire phrase as a sort of imagery. As we've seen throughout, the Quran is using powerful expressions to convey meanings. 
What's the expression here? That if Allah wants something to be, it happens instantly the way he wants it, just as if it was a slave or a servant and he told it to do something and it obeyed him instantly. So the, so the idea, it's like a metaphoric expression. Things obey his will out of absolute obedience, as if they're nothing but in surrender to him. So some interpret it as a mysterious description of the creative act. Others interpret it as, no, it's a metaphor for the ease of creation. When he wants things to be, they be, as if they're in nothing but in total surrender to his will, and they just pop out because he wants them to. And so the final verse, فَسُبْحَانَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ مَلَكُوتُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ That's where the surah ends. And it's very powerful if you think that this is the surah you recite over people as they're, as, as they're dying, like, like we said in, in the hadith. You are going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we've experienced this surah, I think you can all tell how the surah just really transports you. Um, it's tempo, it's beat, especially the beat right at the end. It reads this crescendo right at the top that it just... Uh, it grips you in a really powerful way. And ideally we should be quiet now for a couple of minutes because it really, it plays something within you as it reaches its, reaches its peak here. And you can imagine what it would mean like when someone is on their way out, that it's kind of drawn the full map of everything. The journey on, the absolute power of Allah and that you are going back. And it's just, it's affirmed faith and it's connected you to Allah and to the messenger in this most powerful way. La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. That's Surah Yasin. It's an explanation of what this really means. There's no one to be worshipped except for the one. Gifts are nothing except from the one. You lower yourself totally only before the one. The absolute constant gratitude is only for the one. And Muhammad is the messenger of the one. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallama. He shows the way. He shows the way. And so this is the sharh of all of that. And you, as you end your life, uh, for those who are honored to have this surah in their presence or in their conscience, it's really clear. It's crystal clear where you're going because the arguments are so forceful. It really kicks out of your consciousness any sort of stray thought. And it gives you razor sharp focus on what everything is about. For sub so after you've seen all of that, what's the conclusion of everything? For Subhan al We saw Subhan earlier. Again, this reusing of, of this image, which came earlier. We saw Subhan was an expression of Allah's distance. Not talking about spatial. We're talking about distance in rank. He is far above these paltry imaginations of people of what he is. Whatever your mind figures of the being of God, he's more perfect than that. Whatever words you use, he's more perfect than that. Other than, uh, unless you're using his words. His words are the perfect words. Uh, he is so above these silly suppositions. Who will bring them back? Who has sent you? He has not sent anything. There's no purpose to all of this. We are coming from nothing. This is all an accident of... He's above these, these idiotic statements. Subhana, he is infinitely beyond the ever perfect. And subhan, we said, you always say it, you often say it in times of amazement, subhanallah. And that's when it's often used. When you see something amazing, we say, subhanallah, how amazing is the one who brought this thing about? So for subhan, how perfect, how amazing is the one in his hand, again, to show absolute control. And in his hands, not in anybody else's, in his hand, in absolute control, is the ownership of everything. Malakut means mulk, it means ownership, but it means a uh, mulk also has the uh, milk means ownership, mulk is like dominion. So the malik, who's a king, owns a dominion. We call that his mulk. And Allah's mulk is vast, covers all of the stars we were talking about and all of their light years and all of their galaxies. His mulk is a malakut, it's an incredible dominion. And in his grasp, his total control is the malakut of everything. 
and to him, not to anyone other than him, Turjaun, you are all going to be sent back. Rujua is interesting. I even translated it wrong because I said sent back. But the Arabic for sent back is Turadun. But Rad implies an effort, like I'm pushing you back somewhere. Rujua means, no, it's where you came from, guys. You just went on a journey. You're just going back home. It's very easy. It's the natural course of man. It's going back home. And there's no other way that you're going. Uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I just wanted to end with this slide. We saw it right at the beginning. Uh, the welcome there was a welcome to the course. The welcome here is a welcome to the Quran. My hope, my sincere hope is uh, that this time we've spent together has really opened us up to this very verse, which I explained in the first lesson. And maybe for some of you who were new to this universe, this incredible world, maybe you felt, oh, what does that mean? You know, God has sent down the best of messages, a book. Yeah, this is, I think it's not clear in Aubrey, but every bit of it is stunning. And it says the same thing in different, different ways to change you. It's not there to bring you the novel. It's there to bring you to be your companion in your transformation. And skins tremble of those who really understand what this is about, who have awe of the Lord. And then their skins and hearts soften to remembrance of Allah. And I said that time, this is the book. It's from Allah. If you put yourself into its journey, it will take you back to him. And if you keep yourself in that space, you will feel once you develop this relationship that really, truly, 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 God Almighty is speaking to your heart as you're reciting the book. And this is the miracle of, of this book. And it's a miracle to be experienced. Talking is talking, but walking is walking. And so my hope is that this time we've spent together has shown us something about what is the book and how the book relates to people and how the book uh, transports you. And if you make this book your friend, it's going to be your best friend. If you make this book your companion, it'll be the companion that will never fail you. If you make this book your support that you'll come to in times of troubles, it will always enrich you. And if you take this book with you to your grave, it will not desert you when everybody else will desert you. And that's what this entire month of Ramadan has been about. It's been connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, through this gift of all gifts. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a time that, uh, make this an experience that will never leave us, i.e. this experiencing his book, but rather we take it upon ourselves to take the next steps. And the other thing I wanted to say was, however much I've tried to draw the connections, I want you to understand that there's a myriad ways of ways of how the surah can speak to itself, i.e. The, the goal now is to recite, 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 recite. And as you go through your life's journey, the surah will speak to you with treasures you never felt it had. And the next time, treasures. And the next time, treasures. And so my advice to myself and you is make this a lifetime journey and ask Allah for his help. And that's the guidance of Allah. He guides whomever he wills. And the scholars say, if he's directed you to ask him for something, it's because he wanted to give it to you. So let's ask Allah to give us his book in our hearts and in our lives and in our graves and forever and ever as what takes us through to his garden. If we ask him that, it's a sign that he wants to give it to us. So open your hearts and ask him and it will always be enough for you. Alhamdulillah, I mean, I'm sorry, we've, we've gone over, um, but uh, it was our last time together. Um, just a few questions. Um, is there a subtle difference between this ayah 82 and other ayat where the verb qada used in place of arada, such as Surah Maryam? Uh, that's an excellent question. I don't have the answer, but these are the kinds of questions that uh, as, as we go on with our studies, th these are the questions. They'll perplex you and you'll look and you'll ask scholars. As you learn more, you look in dictionaries and you compare verses and you reflect through life. That, that's why the book is as it is. It's not there so you close it and it's done. 
It speaks to you, but you feel like there's more to be spoken that you've not grasped. And it keeps leading you into its, into its palace, into its rooms. Uh, arada is about willing and wanting. Qada is about fulfilling something. And so here it's about the focus is on when he wants it, it happens. Uh, the focus isn't on that it's happened, that it's been done. Uh, that's all I'll say in, in my moment here, uh, what comes to me. I think it's an excellent question. Uh, and maybe if, if we can find the answer, maybe I can, um, maybe I can write it as an answer to a comment in the, in the video later. So I, I, I will have a look. I, I don't know more than, than what I've said, which is, which is very insignificant really. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a question here that goes back to what we said in our introduction. Like, why do we recite Surah Yasin specifically? Why is it important in one's daily life? What merits does it have for the dead? We've said that, we've said that it's recited over, the, over those who are dying. Some recite when they visit literally the dead in their graves. It summarizes a lot of the themes of the Holy Quran. It summarizes them in a very, very beautiful way, right at the heart of the images of the entire Quran. If you take what we've done in this time and go to almost most of the surahs now, right at the heart, the, 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 all the messages of belief, you'll find that the images have been covered now, but they'll be expressing them uh, differently. And it's right at the heart of, I feel personally, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. And I said people recited often to fulfill needs. The, the people, there's just this relationship Muslims have had. Many people recite it daily. Uh, many people recite it when they're in difficulty. Uh, many people recite it in moments when they want to just dedicate themselves to Allah, like in Iatikaf or you're in a special holy place. You just want to recite something to connect you. Often mm -hmm. it's that chosen one after the Fatiha, which is the much shorter version. Uh, Yes, without a doubt. I was told in verse 59 meant that the nature of hell was that human beings were separated from God. Stand aside today. Is this not correct? And yes, there's this idea of distancing from Allah. He's, he's not pleased with them. They don't enjoy him. They're removed from him. Uh, so yes, there's a belittling of that banishment. Stand aside and go uh, to that place without a doubt. And that's, and that's part of the, the, the real punishment then. Because if the real bliss is to be spoken by, to by Allah and to feel that closeness, then when you know the whole story, the real punishment is that banishment from him. Uh, Jalla Jalaluhu. Why is writing the Quran in Arabic more beneficial than merely reading the translation? Yeah, this is the last thing I'll stop on, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a good question. I think a good answer is what we saw in our concluding section today. This Qur'an is dhikrun wa Qur'anun. It's a reminder for the heart and it's an act of devotion on the tongue. And what, what makes most sense if we, is that we, we do both of these. We don't do just one and ignore the other. If we just recite and we don't know what it is that we're reciting, then yes, we'll benefit from a dhikr and a connection and you'll find a light. And many people of this ummah are illiterate. They recite the Qur'an daily and they find a very great faith affirming fact in that recital and no one should belittle that recital. But we've seen now the book is arguing, it's changing, it's directing, it's opening your mind in various vistas. You lose all of that if you can't do the dhikr, if your heart can't think about it. And so we have to do both. None of these should overcome the other. It shouldn't be that we just read translations and we have no devotional connection because then it becomes theoretical Yes, you reflect, but the core spiritual, almost beyond the mind, the connection with the infinite, which we said is the great thing in the garden, that's here right now as well. Like open your heart and experience it. Sheikh Abdul Hakim gave a very beautiful four minute video just two days ago on what on the, the on the Laylatul Qadr video, just of how it, the mystery of connecting to Allah through his word. You have that here. Train yourself and suddenly and the time will come, your heart will really feel the, the mystery. And illiterate people can feel that mystery. And there's many people from the Ummah who have felt that mystery. But it has a content. And the content is, is obviously what, what the book is celebrating. So all I will say, my advice is, is to do both. Have a time of devotional recitation. Have a time of studying translation. 
And the best thing is translation doesn't always speak as well as a lesson does, like, like, like we've had here. My advice would be try to seek out lessons. And then my advice after that, if you want to take this further, is start memorizing. So the recitation is more internalized, as is the lesson. Then you can combine recitation with meaning. That for me is, is the pinnacle to combine recitation with meaning. And what facilitates that is memorization. So you recite, you read translation, Next step is try to memorize more and more and internalize meanings. And then alongside that, try to attend lessons like these because they give you tools, I hope, uh, that will help you in your study. And after that, if you really want to start this journey, which I really recommend, it sounds impossible, but it's not, it's try to start learning Arabic. You don't have to end your life as a, you know, as a poet, but it's just every little bit you learn, it will pay you back instantly. You, you, you'll be shocked. You learn a little thing, one lesson, you say, wow, it affects you. Then two more lessons, wow, it affects you. So just take that journey and you'll find something, uh, inshallah. And I think that's a wonderful question to end on. I ask Allah SWT to bless all of you, bless your families, accept your fasts. I ask Allah to open up your hearts and my heart uh, to his book and to make it always our guide and our connection to him. I ask Allah to forgive us this month, uh, to forgive us our sins, to save us uh, to save us from, from, from the hellfire and to enter us into that beautiful garden where people are busied from all worries by the joys that Allah has given them and then occasionally they find themselves busied from those joys themselves by their direct connection to him uh, the lord of all majesty and beauty we ask Allah to open up our hearts and eyes so when we drink our milk however difficult it is because it takes practice because we're so familiar when we experience the world that we experience it consciously because when we do that the heart becomes soft and the quran finds its mark instantly uh, wa sallallahu ta'ala ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah